السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام This is Simon Sharif. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm an electrical engineer. I work in Abu Dhabi, Acme Electric Swiss Gear. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Sinan Fatin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sinan. I live in Al-Ain. I study in the International School of Shoifat, and I'm in Great Tan. Thank you very much for the introduction. Now I might start the topic. So the first topic is how do I plan myself in studies so that I can have a successful career. So it is very crucial for us to have a successful career because we are the children of our parents and our parents want us to be successful in life. So there are some tips and tricks to definitely achieve that. Now, I'm going to be asking each and everyone to give me some tips and tricks so that everybody can learn and share from each other. How can we actually have a successful career in our life? So, Mr. Sinan Fatin, do you have any tips? Um, so basically, first... You have to find an interest of yours. Maybe yes. you enjoy like biology or you enjoy coding, whatever. You have to plan ahead of time and do the exams that are required for the job you want to do later. Um, it's... It's also important to um, uh, I forgot what I was about. It's okay, no problem. Better luck next time. Mr. Raihan Ahmed, do you have any tips and tricks to study? Uh, well, I, one thing I'd suggest to most students, and this is an issue that almost all students face, is to avoid burnout, which is basically where a student tries to, you know, go ahead of the teacher maybe, and they try to take in too much information in a short period of time. While some students may be able to handle this, a majority of them actually end up facing burnout where they essentially study too much. So I've experienced this, you know, when I was trying to study for my grade 10 and 11 exams. And it's not a very nice thing because it actually hinders my ability to perform and you know give my exams my practice exams uh, and basically it hinders my thinking ability so i'd say take your time try to understand every topic after you've studied it try to take some time and understand the topic and then only when you're confident then move on to the next chapter slowly because while time is important you shouldn't try to run uh, while you you know you aren't ready to run is what i'm trying to say Yes, thank you. So, and okay, so Mr. Abdullah Tafin has raised a hand. Yes, please, can you share something with us? Um, yeah, one of the one of the thing is burnout. Yes, that is correct. But then, uh, what most ninety five percent of the students do, they procrastinate. That's the main evil. Even I do that, so I'm no saint. But then, the better, like the more regular study you do. And the better you avoid that procrastination and tell yourself and push yourself even harder, like not procrastinate, learn each topic and have passion for what you understand, then I think that's the best because nobody can really say you what to do if you don't like it yourself. Yes, thank you. Mr. Ra Ragi, yes. Can you share something with us? Yeah, I would like to touch on the procrastination part because it's a very serious issue which I think a lot of people face because to them, the idea of planning ahead, planning for their career seems like such a big task that it makes them overlook that the fact that it's not actually that big. You have to focus on the little things. It's the little things that matter that actually help you lead up to the goal. And one advice I would give is to 
focus on discipline and consistency because I think that's the most important part. As long as you're consistent, no matter what it is, you can succeed. So this has something to do with short-term goals where you plan ahead, not too ahead that you uh, that makes you stressed or anything, but you plan what you're going to do, for example, the next day. You plan out. Uh, what your ideal day would look like and you try to make that consistent you do it every single day with discipline and you make sure you do it consistently and make it easy for you don't make it too hard make it a little challenging but not so challenging that it makes you stressed so yeah you gotta focus on the little things and that'll help you procrastinate less and it would might it would also reduce burnout because you're consistently following a thorough plan that's all i have to say yes thank thank you uh does anybody like to say anything else please uh those who are silent uh throughout this session please i encourage you to speak to speak up this is a free session anybody can share anything so please if anybody has any views to share please share with us Mr. Hassan Babur, would you like to share anything? Miss, uh, Miss Adira Rahman, would you like to share anything? Okay, I guess not. So let's move on to the next thing. Uh, Mr. Ragib said, that is one specific word caught my attention, that is consistency. So as far as I've noticed that consistency is something that is lacking in most of the children today when it comes to studies. Because I've seen some toppers of some specific classes, they, their grades, they go from top to the mid, mid uh, section and to the bottom so the only reason can be they they don't feel like studying sometimes and their consistency is lacking so some days they feel like oh i'm gonna study so much i'm gonna top and then the next day they don't feel like studying so they take a break so is there anything uh any tips that any anybody from this meeting have that uh we can uh share that will make us more consistent in our work. So anybody would like to say anything? How can we increase our consistency? Mr. Raihan Ahmed, would you like to say anything? Uh, all right. Uh, now, thing with consistency is that everyone you know everyone is different and different th uh, things will work for different people but for me personally what i've found works the most effectively for me is to actually revise the notes that the teacher has given you on that day because uh you know thing with procrastination is that eventually after a lot of time uh, a lot of work will build up which will put a lot of pressure on you so i feel that it's very important to actually you know stay with the teacher while he's studying and revising each notes for e after each day because the thing is the notes that they give each day won't even take maybe 30 minutes to revise because you know they can't teach that much in a day so when you do this you know consistently each day you'll see that at the end of the week you you've studied everything you have nothing left to study for that week at least and you can maybe focus on extracurricular activities or maybe studying ahead to possibly, you know, gain an advantage, uh, you know, or practice some questions to maybe understand the topics better. So personally, that's what I feel has worked most effectively for me. Okay, thank you so much. Now, Mr. Muhammad Ziad Islam has raised the hand. Would you like to say anything? Um, I would say that uh, motivation is the key. Like, even if you're not doing much, like, as little as doing the homework they've given you, um, at school the same day, just doing that, it would help you stay consistent. And at least it will help you remember what you learned that day. Yes, thank you very much. Now, Mr. 
Najib Mahfouz, would you like to say anything? Those who are silent during the meeting are encouraged to talk. Ms. Radia Khan, would you like to say anything? About how we can increase our consistency? Ms. Mona Lisa Mubarak? Yeah, hello. Hello? Yes, so have you heard my question? I haven't heard. Sorry, can you repeat it, please? Yeah, I'll repeat it for you. So basically, this topic is regarding how we can um, effectively increase our study plan. So my question is, sometimes we can be good at studies, but we are not consistent. So consistency is lacking. So do you have any tips to share with us that can help us increase our consistency? I recommend keeping distractions in a different room. And I also recommend setting a certain timer for how long you should study. And I recommend studying with many different notebooks so you can practice your work and be more consistent. And yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody would like to say anything? Please. Mr. Abdullah Tafin, would you like to say anything? Mr. Abdullah Tafin, can you hear me? Mr. Sinan Fatin, would you like to say anything? Would you have, do you have anything to share? I Mr. don't Sinan have Fatin. anything to share. Uh, well, I encourage you to talk about something because uh, we want to make this uh, session as effective as possible. So it would be very helpful if you would share anything. Because the main theme of this session is for everybody to talk and discuss things that are very cr uh, crucial. So it's very important to speak up. Um, it's good to have a, a time schedule. This can... Um, this can uh, this can make you organized and you you can uh, do different activities throughout your day and this can um this can, this could also help you get better at life and it could also help in many different things like studies uh, it can also help in physical edu uh, physical activities and yeah thank you very much so i want to move slightly uh from this topic that is uh the thing is every time we study something and our parents they have high hopes for us so sometimes it can there has been many occurrences that uh sometimes whenever a student who used to uh, be the topper of the class sometimes has a downfall. They have a bad period. So that often leads to argument and misunderstanding. So those misunderstandings and arguments, they clash back in the long run. So how can those arguments, how can those arguments with parents and the students affect uh, the children in the long run. Can anybody say anything based on that, please? Yes, Mr. Abdullah Tafim. Would you like to say anything? 
Um, uh, yes, uh, the thing is, the clashes, it, uh, there is nothing that can't be solved. So I think that uh, if there is some kind of mutual understanding between the parents and the children, then any issues can be solved. So this is nothing but uh, the, the child can actually have some personal issues that he may or may not share with parents. And if the parents, they focus more on what issues they are going through, and uh, then I think that it will be better for the child be because he will feel more a, a more certain bond with his parents that, yes, my parents do understand me. And when I will be like, it's not like you will always have the highs in your life. When you will be low, then my parents will always be there with me and I will do my best to make them proud. And the uh, parents, they should always think what's good for their child, that uh, they're more than they're worth more than the results they produce so you have to think more on what he is going through and how you can solve it rather than scold him or any misunderstandings that can happen both parties should have b mutual understanding towards each other that's what i think yes thank you very much now miss mona lisa mubarak has raised her hand so if you have anything to say hi my name is saria bin shamil mona lisa mubarak is actually my mother's name okay um, thank you nice to meet you nice to meet you too uh i live in Sharjah. i'm in grade six and i study in rosary school to answer your question it would be very helpful for parents and the ch children to understand each other and talk with each other to help understand why they are feeling down or feeling low. For example, the parent can talk with the student more about and like be more like helpful and understanding as to why they are not at their best. And the student can also try harder and talk with their parents about why they're feeling low and what they can do to help. Then I feel like that the, there would be a very nice bond between the parent and the child and the child and with the parent it, it, we cannot be the best at all times it's very hard it's very difficult not impossible but very very difficult to be at the top at all times but if the parents and the children understood each other and talked with each other more and the parent would always stay by the student's side and vice versa then the student would be doing very good in school Thank you very much. You have made excellent points. So as I've seen, I've heard from you all that uh, it's very important for the parents and the children to have a good communication. Communication is the key. So sometimes I have observed that whenever some children, okay, they, they don't do good in their studies for one specific time and it leads to the parents being overwhelmed. So what actually happens is they force their children to be like, to go one specific way. They, they become very strict. So I'll give you an example. That is uh, a child was allowed to go out and play every day uh, before the exam. But uh, after they have got their results, suddenly just like that, the parents, they have advised the student. I wouldn't say advised, I would say commanded the student that he is not allowed to go out anymore. So I can see that there is a direct shift, an extreme shift of habits and rules. So how does that affect a child's mind? Yes, Mrs. Uh, Mona Lisa Mubarak. I forgot your real name actually, so... It's fine. My name is Saria. Saria, okay. I'll try to remember okay. that. Okay. Uh, a change in an extreme and quick change in habit can lead to like, because if you play every day outside and one day your parents just stop you, it's going to be hard for the child to focus on the studies there because they, a person, it's very hard and it's not in a person's yeah. natural behavior to be able to change their habit in an instant. It will take a time. So if the parent expects the child to 
uh, change their habit very quickly. It will be very hard because the child won't be able to focus on their studies more. So what the, what the parent should do is at least limit the time as to which the child can play and, and limit the time when the child can play or just slowly and slowly start decreasing the time of play and help the student understand why they should study more and play less, then I feel that the student won't have any effect in the long run if the parent decides to do these things when they want to change the child's habits. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is the child's habit should be shifted slowly, slowly, not suddenly. Is that right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So does everybody agree with, does everybody agree with her? Yes, Mr. Abdullah Tafin. Um, yes, I do agree with Saria what she said, um, because if you suddenly just change the rules at all, everything, everything, every fundamentals, everything, then what the child is rather going to do is rebel against you. And then this is going to create more misunderstandings than there already were. So that's the thing. Um, if, if slowly this can be prevented and more, as I already said, mutual understanding so that both the parties, they can understand each other. And also you can limit slowly, slowly. And uh, if it's too direct and it's, if it's too sudden, then I don't think any child is strong enough to cope up with that. And what he will do is uh, think bad about his parents and then there will be a misunderstanding and then the parents are going to think that my child is uh, rebelling against me and even they will feel hurt. So better is that to uh, the mutual understanding between each other. And uh, also that to think that what causes the problems, maybe there is bad influence outside with the friends he hangs out or maybe uh, what does he do inside the home that makes him just go out so much. And then those issues, those small things that cause into bigger problems in the future, those small things are the roots of what's going to happen. So if they can be prevented, then it's going to be better for the long run for both the parents being proud of their child and the child doing good for their parents name. Thank you very much. Mr. Rahan Ahmed, do you agree with everything that's being said? Uh, yes, actually, these are excellent points being brought up. However, what I'd like to add on to of this to strengthen the uh, debate is that the why do the parents actually suddenly stop this there must be a reason and the question is i'd like to ask is why now this could be just a hypothesis is uh, what they that they think that the time you spend going out instead of studying is time being wasted and thus this, that's the reason that you perhaps performed below your uh, average performance now this again goes back to the issue where uh communication between the child and the parent parent is ex extremely important uh so you know, the communication and trust between parent and child has to be nurtured from a young age. So maybe when they go to go to you with their troubles or, you know, discuss, talk, or talk to you about something, you shouldn't just ignore them or give a negative feedback. Instead, you should try to give them a, you know, constructive criticism or a positive feedback to what they did. Now, you know, so this way, now you can understand why you can talk to your child about why they performed worse or you know, discuss about what he does on a daily basis or the type of people he hangs out with. And then you can, you know, with a clear mind, with a level-headed mind, you can understand and diagnose the main issue that possibly caused the child to perform worse. Um, this is not always the case, of course. Sometimes children just have a more difficult time uh, with an exam. So that's also a case that can happen. Uh, maybe he tried his best, but he, it was just wasn't enough or maybe the difficulty of the paper itself was too high. So I feel there should be very solid communication between a student and uh, or, or a child and a parent for issues like these to be avoided in the near future. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Ragib. Okay, so Mr. Abdullah Tafim has raised a hand. So please, comment. Um, I would like to add to certain points that... Uh, the parents should also look at the class as a whole. So maybe the maybe the paper was harder than before, as Rehan Ahmed already said. So uh, rather than just targeting your own child, maybe you should see that maybe the syllabus shift or maybe the 
uh, the like the difficulty of the exam as a whole that has changed so um if you if your child is the only one performing bad then you should focus more on his personal life but then if the class as a whole like it goes down then i think that you should be more understanding towards your children and also help him in that matter no matter what thank you very much now anybody else would like to say anything would like to an- add anything miss radia khan would you like to say anything based on this sentence miss radia khan you with us mr muzaifa yes. yeah okay please elaborate muzaifa thank you sir have you heard the question no i have not okay so the question was sometimes we score good marks but then sometimes we can uh score bad marks because of uh the inconsistency sometimes we are not consistent sometimes we are feel uh, sometimes we feel to study sometimes we do not feel to study so that leads to inconsistency so do you have any tips and tricks on how we can increase our consistency how we can improve our grades that's the main motto oh, oh yeah like um when we don't feel like studying we can like encourage ourselves to study and like we would uh, tell ourselves that we would I have a better result when we do study and uh if you don't feel like studying we can like take uh like 5 minute break sometimes if we like don't feel like studying yeah yes thank you now anybody would like to say anything please those who are silent during the session are encouraged to talk it is very crucial for us to discuss the topics with everybody yes mr ragib please so as they've already mentioned a child doing bad in an exam can be attributed to many external factors that could be outside the control of the student itself and so that is why it's very crucial for the parents to actually know what is causing this like tafim said one of the reasons could be that the paper itself was just harder than usual or there have been changes to the curriculum or something that is outside the student's control and he can do nothing about it so the parents their job have to be their job is to ask the student why this is happening for example like hey man you've been doing really bad even though you were consistently scoring high grades throughout all your years what's wrong is there anything bothering you once this conversation has been cleared up i think the parents can reach a logical conclusion instead of just taking away what's important to the child for example grounding them from going out ever again which can actually make the problem worse if the problem is not identified properly but if it is identified properly then measures can be taken that are effective which can put the child back on track into scoring good grades again tell me after yes thank you very much now anybody would like to say anything please those who are silent are encouraged to talk Mr Hasibur Rahman Mr Hasibur Rahman Okay I guess not So Yes so let me move on to a bit slightly different topic which is now previously we were discussing about uh, the conflict between 
a child and a parent, okay? And how it can affect the children's mind. But oftentimes we have noticed that uh, sometimes in the household, parental conflict can occur. Uh, for example, the father is arguing with the mother or the mother is having some issues with the father. So if the parents, they argue and they have conflict in front of a child, when especially if the child is young, so how can that affect? How can that affect the child? Yes, Mr. Sinan Fatin. Um, there are many different parental conflicts that can affect the child deeply, like um, divorce. Um, yes, divorce. Parental conflict like these can affect the child in a negative way in many different ways. It can possibly lead to the child uh, working like horse and um, possibly even being sad and in the family um, probably less conversations and uh, relationships could be damaged and parental conflict can be very uh, dangerous in the family and it can hurt a lot yes thank you now who uh, i'm sorry for the inconvenience but who uh, who raised the hand for this specific question miss mona lisa mubarak yes parental conflicts can affect the child but it's 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 important to for the uh, it can be hard but it's important for the child to try their best to focus on their studies parental conflicts in the household can affect the child in many ways but it's also important for the child to try to learn um different ways to try to um stay in the flow with it like to try to like like um to try to like be normal with it and try to do other things while the conflicts are happening like try to ignore it that's what i'm trying to say like for example there are lots of different coping methods to try to to try to be calm whenever parents are having conflicts because most children what they do is for let's say they're studying and there's a conflict their the children especially young ones get very anxious and very you know tensed up whenever parents are having conflicts so it's important to try and explore yourself and learn different ways to be calm and not be anxious while parents are having conflicts. It's also important to not be very, you know, very personal, like very ask them personal questions about the conflict because this is a, this this is between the adults and you're supposed and you should try to focus on. It's, it's very or it's very good to try to focus on different methods to try and calm yourself down, and because most children. Having this lead, this leads to most children starting to have anxiety and panic attacks. So it's very important to learn different ways to cope yourself and calm yourself down when parents <clears throat> are fighting. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Rahan Ahmed, please uh, comment on this view. Uh, well, while I do agree with some points she said, I do believe it is also up to the responsibility of the parent the parents themselves to actually, you know, reduce, well, well, not reduce, but to actually avoid conflict and try to manage their anger or whatever issues they have. Because when a child is growing up, especially a young child, when a child is growing up in a hostile environment, you know, as humans do, they will try to adapt to that hostile environment. Uh, and what, what that adaptation, what they mean, they, they might become more aggressive, more violent, uh, they might d d develop some disorders of sorts, maybe even cases where there have been PTSD, where there's a lot of screaming and, you know, children are affected by that. So I believe it should be, you know, you sh if you do have conflict, you should at least try to keep it, the bare minimum is to try to keep it away from the child. Because for young children, 
while I do agree coping for older children could work, for younger children, they actually, you know, since they're so young, they don't understand how to exactly cope or they don't have access to the methods, perhaps. So for younger children, conflict is a very dangerous thing, which can lead them into, you know, very dangerous paths. They might associate themselves with uh, people who are also violent and angry because they have been surrounded by people like that. Uh, you know, in their childhood and as they're growing up. So when they do that, they'll be led down a very dangerous path. You know, maybe they'll, uh, you know, start doing crimes, committing crimes, doing all sorts of substances that are bad for them, simply because they ha they uh, tend to make friends with people who are similar to, uh, you know, who are hostile or similar to what they grew up with. You know, conflict and anger, being surrounded by that all the time. So I feel like, the bare minimum a parent can do is at least to make sure the child does not hear any of the conflict or the most they can do is to avoid the conflict and try to settle it with a calm, rational mind. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Ragib, do you agree with Mr. Raihan Ahmad? Yes, absolutely. Children... Would you like... Yeah. yeah. Please continue. As you mentioned, Conflict is very dangerous, especially for children, because children are very impressionable. They easily get influenced by the things around them. And when parental conflict occurs, usually many other things like aggressiveness, disagreements, shouting, probably for hours and hours and hours, this can negatively influence the child. And as previous people have mentioned, they may resort to coping mechanisms that can actually be harmful but also good for the child at the same time because some of the ways these children who are distressed by the parental conflicts the way they deal with them is by con by going to a therapist or talking to people about it being open about the conflicts so that they can let all their emotions out which is a good thing that's a good coping mechanism that can let their emotions flow out and not affect their daily lives. So that is one way. But however, there's also many bad things that can happen, many bad coping mechanisms that are intended to forget about the conflict itself, which can actually harm the child. One of the examples that I can share is self-harm. Children tend to resort to harmful methods that involve injuring themselves uh, in order to forget about the problems or the conflicts that happen in their household, because through pain, it allows the people, the, the children, to feel a sense of control over themselves. The pain can distract their minds away from the conflict. They can, uh, it helps them forget about the conflict and forget about all the emotions through pain, which is very harmful. It's not recommended. Some also go for they resort to drugs to forget about these issues, which is probably even worse. And yeah, those are some really bad things that are detrimental to this child's health and mental well-being. Yes, thank you very much. So from based on what I heard from all of your opinions is that uh, children, especially young children, they can be vulnerable. Now, the father and the mother are the two persons in their world that they have to completely trust. They have to look, uh, look upon. So the moment when both of those two persons, the father and the mother, they argue, a sense of trust is broken. So the child is in a maze. Now he is thinking that whom should I trust? Should I trust the father? Should I trust the mother? Now it basically, uh, it basically adapts. It basically, sorry for the inconvenience. One minute, please. Yes. So basically, the child is faced and uh, exposed to many kinds of coping mechanisms, which can be good, but also can be bad. So the good ones being maybe the, maybe, maybe the child might go to a friend uh, and maybe let out all his emotions and maybe the friend will try to uh, calm him down or 
he can resort to some other type of co- uh, coping mechanisms, which can be drugs, especially if we see serial killers, if we see gangsters and all those kind of bad persons in the society. If we look at their background, oftentimes we can see that it's the way that they have made their nature is uh, based upon the way they have been treated in the past. So if you had a chance, uh, if you had a chance to uh, redeem somebody who has been through that, so what did you give him? What did... So can anybody share anything? Mr. Abdullah Kafin. Um, Would you, you like to say question, anything? Please? Yes. So my question was, if you had the chance to uh, calm somebody down or to redeem somebody who has been through a rough childhood, how would you uh, how would you help him in the long run? How would you? Uh, yeah. So you you get the point. Um, thing is, uh, if the parents they fight, then uh, of course there is gonna be the parents the issues, and he the child is never gonna recover. The amount of love he's supposed to get, he's never gonna get that anybody like from anybody else. But the thing is, the people around him, if you're his friend, you can just try to give. So then understand his feel, and then try to bond with him, and make him make him like uh, comfortable around you because uh, and give him the attention he deserves because if he did not get get the attention because of his parents fighting his parents they were mostly focused on i don't know how to just uh, go against each other this really hurts the child and the child is the one who gets the most affected by these irresponsible parents who fight in front of the kids so you as a friend you can just try because there's no going back but then what you can do is you can just try to calm him down try to say that these things are really common and you have to look forward in life and also the thing is the void that has been missing you can just be really faithful to him just uh, make him trust you and then you should trust him and always give attention to him that's the thing you can do as a good friend and also advise him against what can be good for him, what can be bad for him. That's the thing you can do. Thank you very much. Miss Mona Lisa, please elaborate. Okay. <clears throat> so if I had a friend, if my friend was going through the same thing I did, I would, I would share my experiences with my friend and I would help them understand that what they're going through uh, happens in lots of families and that it's perfectly normal. And um, if I was going through the same thing, I would give my friend some different methods that I've learned over the years to keep myself calm and to keep myself focused on my own life and not focused on all of the things happening in my background and my family. And I would just try to calm her down and I would make, I would try to make my friend feel as if she's worthy because lots of people Lots of people, when they when they notice their parents fighting, especially young children, they start to resort to, they start to feel like they cannot trust their parents anymore, so they go to friends. And a friend's job is supposed to make your friend feel better. So I would recommend them to either go to therapy or I would recommend them to just openly talk with me if I have gone through something like that. I would calm them down and let them know that they are loved and that they're worthy and that they're a good person and that the parents' conflict is not their fault because most children blame themselves for their parents' conflict and then they do some other things that will be very harmful to them just so that they can distract themselves from everything going on in the background. Thank you very much. Now, anybody has to say anything? Please, those who are not talking, they're encouraged to talk. Yes, Mr. Abdullah Tafin. Um, I would like to add to the fact that uh, most likely if the person, uh, if he has some parental issues, then he's not going to open up. 
to any kind of therapist because to him it will feel embarrassing because he, since he did not have any kind of parental figures he does not know who to trust so as a friend you should try to make him open up so that he doesn't bottle up all his emotions and he can do some self harm and also you should mostly guide him against the bad things he does check up on him as and be responsible and try to i don't know step up where his parents lacked that's what a true friend does in this age of bullying and everything for it yes thank you very much now anybody would like to say anything does everybody agree with mr tafin mr rajib Yeah, I agree with Tafim. I think he made some really good points and also I would like to add that I would like to add that these issues they're not common. They're not normal. They're not normal issues. So a friend who has experienced the same issue or is trying to lend a helping hand to the person who is suffering through the same issue their job is to be the shoulder to lend them a shoulder that they could cry on not to overshadow their personal experience with their own because you can't just say oh i've experienced the same thing as you but even worse so just deal with it no you can't do that that's not going to make them feel better you have to give them tips advise them as to how you personally you managed to overcome your own issue and guide them through the same path that you took so that they can also manage to overcome their own personal issues that's all yeah thank you so based on what i've heard from all of you is that uh we should lend them a shoulder to, to cry on so that they can uh prevent themselves from bottling bottling up their emotions so that they can just vent it out so my question this question uh, is raised in my mind that is should the child okay who has suffered ov- be over emotional do you think being over emotional is a good thing for the child yes mr abdullah tafim um this question is actually weird in itself because if he is a child so the amount of emotions he will feel if he bottles it up too much then he's going to do some kind of self harm and if he vents it out to the wrong person then he's going to pay for it because the other person could just make fun of it or leak it or something that could that could make the child even do more self harm uh, we don't uh, not everybody has the same level of emotions not everybody feels the same so i think is that what the child can do is find somebody that can be trusted for, uh, and uh, make yourself with good company so being over emotional is not uh, is not what you can control but then it is totally okay because it's normal you can be emotional because you don't have to hide anything but then you shouldn't show your emotions in front of everybody because not everybody cares but then find a person who really does and you can vent it out to him and if he does care then he would say something that would make you feel better yes Thank you very much Miss Mona Lisa Mubarak would you like to say anything based on what Abdullah Tafim has said Yes I agree with what he said you're supposed to find friends that care about you and that care about what you have to say to them because if you're friends with people with the wrong kind of people and you vent out your feelings to them you will not find good people everywhere so maybe those people will overshadow overshadow you with their experiences as someone else said and they are going to make you feel bad for it they might make you feel like their experiences they're going to try to make you feel like their experiences are much worse than yours and they're going to make you feel that your experiences don't matter and they're going to make you like think that you your this is not that serious and it is very normal but behavior like this is not normal you're supposed to be in a calm and happy environment so it's very important <coughs> 
sorry. It's very important to find a friend who cares about you and then you can vent your feelings to them because if a friend makes you feel bad for something that's not your fault, kids can resort to other methods to help them cope, like self-harm. And these methods are not good for anyone and it's not good for anyone because this is like a very bad thing. So kids should be able to openly talk with their parents but friends should always be available and not make any of their other friends which are going through the through a bad thing make them feel like they're worthless or something so that's why it's important to find good people to talk to thank you very much now Please, I repeat again, those who are not talking during the session are encouraged to say something. Please, this session's main objective is to make each and everybody comfortable with speaking openly. This is a free session. Everybody can share their own opinions. Please, Ms. Hafsa Afrin, would you like to share anything with us? Ms. Hafsa Afrin. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hasibur Rahman. Please share something with us. Mr. Huzaifa Ahmed. Please, would you like to say anything? Mr. Khan Ridwan, please, if you like to share anything. Um, what was the question? <laughs> the question was, the question was, when, okay, if you have been through a rough childhood, okay, maybe let's say your friend, he has been through a rough childhood, and then he shares his problems with you, okay? Would you encourage him to be overly emotional? How would you help him? How would you uh, make him feel comfortable? If you can say anything on that. How would you make your friend feel good if he is going through something? So, yes, Mr. Khan Ridwan, would you like to say anything? Please share with us. Anybody? Okay, I guess not. So now the last and final topic is should autistic children be educated alongside normal general education children? So sometimes in our society, we see that some people, they have learning difficulties. So some people, they might not understand uh, as much as the normal people. They have less capacity. They have less capability, they have less memory than the normal person. For example, a person, if he's suffering uh, from Down syndrome, he would have a bit of a less understanding and he would have a bit of a less memory than a person who is normal. So this is a rather controversial question. So the question is, I repeat again, should autistic children be educated alongside general education children? So some people, yes. Thank you, Mr. Sinan Fatin, for raising your hand. Would you like to say anything? Um, for those who didn't understand what autistic means, basically, if someone is like 10 years old, they would have the mentality of like a five-year-old. Um, when, if 
uh, when people act like uh, they are younger than the average like if they're autistic and they're placed in a class with uh, normal students they could cause more disruptions and um the others won't be able to uh, learn proper, properly the the proper way to teach an autistic child is to probably uh homeschool um teachers can uh, the less students in a class the more the more easier it is to handle and i've seen this in um, a lot of my classes and i think uh, just teaching the autistic child alone is the best way of teaching an autistic child yes thank you now miss mona lisa please what is your opinion yes i agree that like aut- this children with disabilities like autist autism or down syndrome or any other disabilities should be shouldn't be they they shouldn't be like uh, treated as unequal they are the same people as we all are and they shouldn't be given less opportunities than anyone else they might be distracting so it's recommended to give them personal or private tutors or let a teacher teach them alone because people with autism or down syndrome are can be very distracting and it's it's not really recommended to put all of them in one class like all autistic and disabled disabled children in one class but there is an option for that if the parent is willing to do that but it's recommended for the child to study with a teacher alone because it's easier for the teacher to teach one student and it's easier for the student to understand the teacher without any other distractions in the class from other students also if a, if a disabled student is placed with all other normal students then then it, there's a very high chance that the normal students will bully the uh, the child with a disability and it will make the child feel very bad for it thank you very much now mr abdullah tafim do you agree with miss mona lisa mubarak i agree with some of the points she said but then as we but then autism doesn't mean that uh, he has to have a mentality of a 5 year old autism actually means that uh, maybe they can have different ways of learning they are maybe a little bit different maybe they will have a uh, trouble in communication uh, maybe they will be troubled in some ways of social interaction so what i think is that they can be like not one person but maybe five or 10 children they can be in a normal class because if they are treated separately then they will never be able to develop the social interaction they lack so if they are in a classroom by only the teacher then like uh, he will not have enough human interactions so uh, he it doesn't mean that he understands less maybe he, the uh, may, some of the autistic kids they understand way more than a normal one they are not exactly disabled they just are different so and the and the children who bully these kind of autistic children they these people they are horrible so they should be punished because they at the end of the day is one world we live in so i think that um if they are all in the same room then rather the kids who believe they should understand the feelings of being different so if they could put themselves in other shoes and maybe they can help to learn and even help the child autistic kid but then if that autistic kid lacks in some kind of academic uh, uh, academic result or maybe some exams or some capabilities then he can take extra classes with a teacher but then i think at the end of the day every kind of kid because they are equal because equality is the main prospect or main topic so i think since it is equality so uh, all of them should be together because it's one world we live in but then if he lacks in some kind of uh, maybe academics or maybe social interaction then he could always take extra classes with a teacher thank you very much miss mona lisa mobara Elaborate. Yes, I agree with what Abdullah said, and I would like to add a point. It's um, as he said, it's also very important for people with disabilities to socialize because 
if people don't socialize, like if people with disabilities don't socialize, then when they grow older, um, they will be like very, they're going to be very um, like disocialized. And whenever people are going to talk to them, they're going to act in a weird way. And they're going to be very, they're going to, there's a chance that they're going to be very frightened because they've never really been with anyone before. They've never been social before. So there's a chance that they're going to be frightened with what people are doing, and people are going to laugh at the person for that. So I agree that it's important for a person with a disability to learn how to socialize and make friends without being made fun of, and it's important for them to also learn how to stand up for themselves. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Raghi. Please. I agree with some of the points both of them have just said, but there are some points that I would like to make that go against that. First of all, yeah, autistic people, of course, the only way they can improve their communication skills and blend in with the society around them is to be with the general public, the general students, the people who have the typical, the people who are not autistic. So yeah, that's one of the things I agree with. And of course, this is going to be helpful for the autistic person. However, does not mean that it will be helpful for the other people, the people who are not autistic. And as they have mentioned that bullying is an issue and they just said that other people have to learn to deal with autistic people. But however, that's not as easy as just saying it because there are people who are not even autistic that get bullied in school. They're not, they're basically normal, but they still get bullied for other things. So just imagine how an autistic person would be treated in a school with the general people. In addition to that, teachers in general schools are not trained to handle people who are autistic. They're usually trained to teach those who are not autistic, which is most of the people in the school. And so this could cause even more problems, more distractions, more disruptions in the class because the autistic person is basically just uh different from the other people in in terms of learning capabilities and the teacher has to pay extra attention to that student specifically which could disrupt the learning experience of all the other students so that is one of the disadvantages of grouping them all together however if it can be done it should but in most cases i don't think it can be done and so the best possible way to deal with this issue is to privately make the autistic person more I guess, experienced and more comfortable with the society around them so that in the future, maybe they will be able to more quickly adapt to their society, to the society and blend in with the general students as well. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Raihan Ahmed, which side are you on? Should the autistic children be educated alongside general education or no? Oh, well, first of all, I'd like to start off with um, an understanding or trying to explain what autism it actually is it's uh, autism is actually a spectrum of you know it's a spectrum you can't place a child in one um but the most common you know most common disorders with the uh, autism are that they have communication issues as mentioned earlier uh, they also have struggle they struggle with social interaction they have obsessive disorders and things like that so where i stand in between these two discussions is i'd say in the middle because I disagree and agree with both points. I do believe a child with autism should be introduced into the general public. However, I, I'm in my personal opinion, and it's not actually an opinion, it, it is being practiced nowadays, is that what happens is a special needs child is what they're called, is placed into a special school made for student people like them. So they're placed in a separate school because a normal classroom would just provide be, be providing too much stimulus for them. I don't think anyone here has been in a classroom that's been quiet from morning till the end of the school, you know. So there's a lot of there's a lot of talking, loud noises, scratching, and just a lot of background noise, which can, which will affect the child with autism very negatively. It might cause them pain, discomfort, and they might even have a panic attack in such uh, situations. So what these special uh, schools do is that they 
not only have teachers who are specially trained, as Sadam mentioned earlier, uh, the normal teachers aren't trained to handle uh, special students with special needs. So in these schools, there are teachers who are actually trained for that, and they'll be able to basically educate the child with the normal syllabus, you know, uh, the normal subjects, along with slowly teaching them how to better manage social interactions and handle this type of stimuli from the environment. And after a certain grade, after they've, you know, the teacher themselves in the school sees fit that this child who has autism has been, you know, been educated properly and they're able to deal with it. Then uh, I've seen cases where they're introduced into a normal schooling system. Um, you know, at the age of maybe 14, 15, they're introduced into a normal schooling system, which, you know, they'll be more easily able to manage and handle because they've been given uh, prior training for that. So that's where I stand, is that directly putting a child with autism into a normal school will you know, definitely backfire because the child simply won't understand how to manage uh, or control what they're feeling, what they're hearing, or uh, they can't control it, right? So with proper training and uh, management uh, education, they'll be better able, better suited to handle these, uh, in these environments and situations. Thank you very much. So, yes, Mr. Abdullah Tafin, please elaborate. Um, I agree with uh, Re what Rehan Ahmed has said, but then um, regarding autism, uh, what w the people who understand more than the ones who are disabled is that uh, we do understand more, right? So it's our duty as well to treat them properly. And also, just like uh, UAE is a really good example because they have termed the people of people with disabilities as people of determination. So those positive terms and terminologies and uh, those kind of uh, empowering acts must be done so that they feel more included and comfortable. It's our job. Thank you. So I can see there is difference between two parties, some agree and some they don't agree. So I see that this is rather a controversial question, which makes it more exciting. So anybody else would like to share anything? Whether Mr. Sorry, Miss Hafsa Afrin. Mr. Sinan Fatin, do you have anything in mind? Mr. Sinan Fatin. Mr. Ms. Radia Khan. Would you like to say anything? Ms. Radia Khan. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, question, which I am currently asking that is, uh, as Mr. Sinan has said that uh, one of the solutions that we can do uh, if we want to teach autistic kids is to homeschool, uh, as he said. But then I rather have one question. Uh, that is, if an autistic child is homeschooled, he would be uh, deprived from the experience of the real world. Would that not affect him? Is home education effective for the autistic children? Would anybody like to say anything? Yes, Miss Mona Lisa Mubarak, please speak. Yes, my name is Saria, and I would just like okay, to say, I would just like to say that it's a while. It's very like 
healthy for the autistic or disabled child to study, but be, to be homeschooled, it will also be very effective for the child to learn better social skills because what will happen in the future, the child will not be able to react properly to the real life and this will affect the child in many, many, many ways, in ways that it's very unexplainable and it's going to be very difficult for the child to know how to react. It will be very difficult for the child itself in the real life. So while being homeschooled is a good thing for the child, it's also if important for the child for, to make sure that the child learns social skills at the same time. Thank you. Mr. Raihan Ahmed, please. What do you think about autistic ch kids uh, being homeschooled? Well, now, as I said before, you can, does a name for autistic children have been given is a special needs, right? And uh, by the definition of what they say is special needs is that they aren't like normal children. Now, for a lot of normal, for a lot of students, I've seen homeschooling actually works. Now, what it does do is a negative that it does derive that student of a school experience, you know, the school life experience. You know, maybe they might not develop as many friendships as a normal student might. But this can also be, uh, my argument could also be made that they are avoiding maybe the most of the negative aspects of school, be, you know, being friends with the wrong type of people and that. Uh, but that's just for normal people. For children with autism, uh, as I said before, mentioned earlier, that there are special schools made for them. Now, if the parent understands how to educate this autistic child uh, into better managing their, uh, you know, disorders and improving their social skills and how they interact with people and being able to handle all of the stimuli, I believe that homeschooling, while it does rob them of the school experience, would be, you know, almost as effective, you could say. But if the, but not in most cases, the parent. Or will have will not have the knowledge of how to educate a child in those regards. So personally, in those in majority of the cases, I don't think a child should be autistic child should be homeschooled. Instead, uh, they must be placed in a special school for them, where they can possibly meet other children like them and make friends with them. And this could be very positive towards their you know growth as they have someone they can relate with. Uh, you know, someone who they they see as having the same issues as them or, you know, basically making the child feel more normal in a environment where they aren't usually considered normal uh, by what the standards are. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rag Ragir, please, what is your opinion? I actually stand by the same arguments made by Raihan and I think homeschooling autistic children just makes them more autistic because what they're lacking is social skills. And if you're lacking something, your main primary goal has to be to improve that thing. You have to account for that lack by having more, being exposed to more social gatherings and to improve your communication skills as well. So I do believe homeschooling has its benefits because autistic children has their own specialties uh, there's special ways of learning that need to be personalized by a certain uh, by a teacher and it cannot be done with the general public so I think homeschooling has its benefits but it's just making the child worse off in the long run so I think homeschooling is actually more detrimental to the autistic person's uh, future as well that's all thank you very much and anybody else? Please, those who are not talking are encouraged to talk. Mr. Abdullah Tafim, please. So. I stand by Raghib and Rehan as they said that um, uh, this homeschooling makes the autistic persons more autistic, but then uh, they do need special needs. And I think the trained, a trained teacher really knows how to handle all those together. So why not? make them more social, the things which they lack, rather than just make them less social at home. Well, how will he be uh, when the parents are not going to be in this world, he's going to be fending for himself. So why not make him prepared for the real world? 
Yes. Thank you very much. Now, please, those who are not talking or are silent during the session, please. You're encouraged to speak up. This is a free session. Anybody can share anything that they like. Okay, uh, I guess not. So with the last uh, topic, we have come to the end, almost the end. Now this is a question answer session. Now this session uh, will be around 15 minutes. Now the main objective of this session is to the participants can ask each other questions. If they have any queries, please you're encouraged to ask questions, please. So if you have any questions regarding the three topics that we have discussed, uh, please speak up. Yes, Miss Mona uh, Saria. Yeah, Miss Saria. Have yes. Raised your hand. My question is, <coughs> sorry, my question is for Abdullah Tafim. If what if a child is what if an, a child with with autism or is on the autism spectrum is not ready for the real world world? And what if you put them in the real world and you realize that they're not ready for it? What happens then? then you adapt, then what happens is you take him back and then make him prepared. At the end of the day, he is going to have to go to the real world anyways. So you just uh, make him go with a better teacher and then he's going to recommend what's better for him. So if anything, anything happens in those special cases, then what he can do is you, he can just improvise. And then at the end of the day, he's going to still have to go to the real world. Nobody can really live abandoned or alone. So that's what like that's what's gonna happen like he's gonna have to adapt eventually so slowly slowly he can be adjusted to the real world okay thank you yes thank you now anybody else would like to ask any question now anybody can ask a question and multiple people can answer to that there is no problem there is no specification that this person person should answer to this person only there is nothing like that so please mr abdullah tafim please ask your question my question is for ragib when uh, i quote he said that homeschooling an autistic kid makes him more autistic what do you mean by that exactly are you trying to get me cancelled, brother? I thought we were friends, man. Let's have a friendly fire. Uh, I'm sorry. That's entertaining. I'm just saying, homeschooling is basically just keeping them locked up in the bubble that they're already in, and it's just going to make it even worse. They need to break out of that bubble and face their fears, get more exposure to the society around them. That way, they can actually improve and blend in with the non-autistic people. That's what I meant. All right. I'm yes, Mr. Raihan Ahmed. Please, if you have any questions, you can ask. Um, not really. Everything has been clear so far. I do believe that, you know, Sadab's use of saying that uh, homeschooling autistic children makes them more autistic is a bit offensive uh, towards, you know, special needs. Uh, but other than that, so far, it's been a great discussion. Yes, I sense a I would... strong opinion. Yeah, okay. So, Mr. Abdullah Tafim, please respond. Yes, I think I think that uh, what he said was offensive and shouldn't be used next time in these kind of meetings. I'm sorry if I offended any autistic people in this meeting. Okay, so that was that caught me off guard, but never mind. So, Miss Fafa six two three would like to ask any question. Uh, yes. Yes. To please. to Saria. Okay, please proceed. 
Why should autistic kids not go with normal school, like with normal kids? Be- because I, I, I like I'm very like my mind is so uh, like on different sides right now. But to answer your question, it's it will be good for the child to socialize with other people in normal schools, but. If they do, what if what will happen if the child is like being bullied at school? It's not, their parents won't be there at school, and in normal schools, the teachers are usually like not specially trained to teach autistic children there or disabled children. They're just like trained to wow. just teach normal children, which is normal that is considered in the society that kind of normal. So what if the child is getting bullied at the school um, and or what if the child is made fun of or something like that? Then the child will start to feel bad and maybe they will be too shy to open up to their teachers because if the child was homeschooled before and they have just been put into a school with normal people, they will not know how to socialize and they will not know how to react to bullying. So this will be very harmful for them and very like bad for them in the long run. Okay, thank you for ask, answering my question. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes, Mr. Raji, please ask your question. Oh, well, it's not actually a question. I just want to clarify that I have nothing against autistic people. And I've seen that people categorize humans into two different categories. One is autistic people, the other is normal people. But I think all people are normal just because autistic people, they have certain things in their brains, their neural networks that cause them to behave differently. It doesn't necessarily make them different. And I think what Tafim said about uh, giving them proper terms like people of determination instead of people with disability or something is crucial. And the proper term for people who are not autistic is actually neurotypical people. They're not normal people, they're just neurotypical people because their brains function typically as to what is expected, while autistic people are just special in their own, way, uh, in their own ways. So I think they're all normal at the end of the day and I have nothing against any of them. Thank you. You're welcome, we accept your apology. Uh... Okay, so Mr. Abdullah Tafim, please speak up. Um, uh, since the session is going to come to an end, I just would like to ask a question to Raghib. Since he said that, um, uh, like, the things, like, uh, an autistic people is just, like, autistic person is just normal, and uh, he's just equal to anybody else. So should, can an autistic person run for president of a country? I think one already has in America. It's called Joe Biden, bro. Yes, I do agree. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see that. Uh, That definitely caught me off guard. But uh, I'll try to make this as professional as possible. So, yes, Mr. Amzad Khan, I think you have raised a hand. Would you like to say anything? Would you like to ask a question or anything like that? Okay, That's it. So, I believe we can yes. finish. Huh? Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So with that, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you for everybody. Uh, to join this wonderful session and it's been really nice talking and socializing with people and sharing uh, whatever opinion we have based on the topics provided so until we meet again assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah i have i have one question yes uh, for please. the pro- program for the session so today yeah. our program was uh, our target was uh, to finish in one hour. Huh? The session was targeted for one hour. Now it is extended to one and thirty minutes. What do you think uh, that one and thirty one hour and thirty minutes is okay, or one hour we should uh, limit this one for the next session? 
usually i think uh, one hour is definitely okay because some people they might have work so i believe that one hour would be efficient and i would be i would try to be more professional as professional as possible assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam uh i am indeed ramjad from abu dhabi thank you uh, mr tahsin abdullah tahsin for for your good uh, presentation today professionally uh, i am very much uh, like impressed that uh, today's session was very good topic important topic among us to discussion with the kids and the parents and uh, normally for uh, every session so uh, we are like uh, we uh, like invited to one special guest or something today uh, i'd like to uh, give some opportunity to talk about our session uh, um, our brother shah imran uh, imran bhai please uh, if you are here so raise your hand and talk about something about our session imran bhai hi assalamu alaikum uh, this is imran uh, i'm uh, working in uh, abu dhabi uh, anyway this is a excellent session done by the young kids and uh, i really i, I admire that the way that they have presented and uh, i hope that this good initiatives will continue and uh, it will it will help all of the young kids and young stars and 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 even the adults like us thank you so much Uh, do you have any advice uh, regarding the session that how can we improve uh, professionally uh, in the society i believe they have tried their best and uh, but in, you know that uh, the time constraint it should be uh, it yeah, should it be nice time limited yes yeah it should be managed nicely right. if if the session cannot conclude within the time it can yeah. goes on another session but the time that should be concluded within the time frame that yeah. is been conducted earlier uh so i would like to uh, share something with the engineer uh, reja bhai also uh, to the to the session such as just i observe something like uh, in our participant we have different classes of participants in this session like uh, high level mid level and lower level like uh, university levels like school like seven eight grade or like five or six grade also there so the topic uh, we will uh, select like this that to make interest in this session to all, all the participants uh, some like if we have the three questions uh, the one questions will be in the high level one question will be the moderate level and one question will be the junior level that they can uh, in we can encourage them to participate to share their views ideas informations uh, with the sessions so for this oa we will arrange the next session basically uh, so this is my uh, op opinions i share with you i especially thank you abdullah tasin our moderator today and especially all our, our kids those who are participating and and give them their ideas views and information uh, sharing with each others this is our target actually that what you know and we have to share with this, your friends uh, so thank you very much assalamu alaikum Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we can conclude the uh, today's session. Thank you all. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. It's been nice uh, to talk to all of you. And until we meet again next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.